Rebecca's short introduction through my section and then at slide 20. Get started, although people may come in as, as we're, we're getting started here. So um, first, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to our webinar on research data services and academic libraries, overview and case studies from two universities. Um, this webinar is being presented by the Michigan Academic Libraries Association STEM Interest Group. Um, and our speakers today are Elaine Meyer and Joanna Thielen. Uh, if we want to advance the slide forward. Okay, and here you see a little bit more about our speakers. Uh, first, we're going to be hearing from Joanna Thielen, uh, research data and science librarian from Oakland University, which is in Rochester, Michigan. Um, and Elaine Meyer will be speaking next. She's our, the engineering librarian from the University of Michigan Dearborn. Um, so this is a brief outline of what we're going to be covering today. Um, we're going to be giving uh, this introduction on data and research management and what that means for academic libraries. Um, Joanna and Elaine will be talking a little bit about their uh, institutions and what they've done there. Um, we are going to then talk about some suggested resources that will be helpful for you as you're thinking about research data management at your institution. Um, we have saved time at the end for doing questions and answers. So um, we're not going to be doing them after each speaker. So, but you can type in any questions that occur to you at any time in the chat. Uh, and I will keep track of those and read those out at the end. And hopefully we'll get a chance to get to everyone's questions. Um, again, if you are not speaking, please mute yourself so that we can keep the sound as clear as possible. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Joanna. All right, thank you, Rebecca, for that kind introduction. Um, as Rebecca mentioned, I'm Joanna Thielen. I am research data and science librarian at Oakland University in uh, Michigan. So before we get started talking about research data services that I provide at my library and what Elaine does at her library, I'd like to start with some definitions and give us all an overview of this area so that we all have a common uh, background on these topics. Whenever I'm doing presentations on these topics for faculty or students at my campus, I also like to start with these definitions because they can often be, um, data can be a very confusing term and many people may not have heard of the term research data management or RDM. So as you might imagine, there are many different definitions out there for data. Uh, many funders have their own data, uh, definitions for data, including the federal funders within the US government. So the National Science Foundation and the National Institute Institutes of Health are two examples of um, funding agencies who have their own definition of what data is. You can see the NIH's definition over here on the left. So that is tailored to their research communities, so specifically the science or biomedical community. Um, the definition of data that I actually like the most is listed over here on the right. Data are anything you perform analysis on. First of all, it's a very simple and easy to understand definition. Also, it um, applies to all of the disciplines, everything from the humanities to sciences and engineering. We want to include all of the disciplines in our, our definition. And finally, you can imagine under this definition of data, many different things, many different research outputs being considered data. So this slide lists a few types of data. By no means is it an exhaustive list. It includes things from what you would traditionally think of as data, so outputs of uh, lab equipment or experiments, to things that you may not necessarily think of as data, such as software or code, um, video or audio recordings, as well as physical samples, which brings up the point that data is not only digital, it can be physical as well. When you say the term data, most people think of numbers that are stored in a spreadsheet. But data can be all sorts of digital files as well as physical things too. It can be papers that people collect, it can be handwritten research or observation notes, it can be physical samples that were collected from um, trips to the field or things that were created in a lab. So moving on to research data management. Unfortunately, this term doesn't have a nice, tidy definition like data does, but the data, the uh, definition that I like the most is here. It's the compilation of these practices that essentially make your data easier to use as well as other things. 
Um, so with this definition of research data management, or RDM, there's many different uh, practices that go into place. And here's a list of those of high-level topics that go into RDM. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but um, it covers many of the different areas within research data management. So reading through this list, um, you're probably pretty overwhelmed. It is a lot of different things. And you can imagine that in order to be effective at research data management, a researcher needs to put these practices into place throughout their research life cycle. It's not just an activity that it's done in the planning phase of a project or something that's done at the end of a project. It really does need to be incorporated throughout in order to be effective. For example, with organizing your files, it's more effective to do that throughout the research as those files are generated rather than trying to go and organize them at the end of the project, which might be years after some of those files have been collected. So why did research data management evolve? So it's been, um, there's been an awareness in academia for about the past 10 or 15 years that research data management is a good practices um, researchers should be putting into place. So the global recession in the late 2000s really sparks um, more interest and more attention in this area. Specifically with the U.S. federal government, there was budget cuts at funding agencies such as the NSF, NIH, DOE. So these federal funders only wanted to fund projects that made the best use of their money. So in order to determine that, they asked grant applicants to start submitting a data, a data management plan, which is a two-page addendum to a grant proposal. And that addendum basically states their research data management practices both during and after the research project. Um, and Elaine will be talking a little bit later about how she is providing a review service for those data management plans for researchers to make sure that they are putting in effective and feasible plans into their um, grant proposals. Also with the rise of digital data and now research on a massive scale, as well as the terms like e-research and e-science, um, it's much easier to share data, especially data that's been created digitally. We can share data by sending it as an email attachment to a person that's across the world in a few seconds. And that is um, not used to be the case. But also digital data is inherently much more fragile than physical data. If you take data such as a book, remember data are anything you perform analysis on, if you put that book on a shelf in a library or an archive and you keep it with reasonably good conditions, it will still be there in a usable condition in 100 years. But the same can't be said about digital data. I'm sure many of us have digital data or digital files from even a decade ago that we aren't able to access because the files become corrupt, the software is no longer available, or maybe it's on an obsolete hardware type such as a floppy disk. And finally, there's been um, very high profile examples of data fabrication, sloppy data management, and that's coupled with this reproducibility crisis that has been happening in uh, many disciplines across academia there's just been this realization that we researchers need to put these practices into place in order to ensure that we really are doing the highest quality scholarship possible. So academic libraries have kind of jumped into the ring of offering RDM services within the past 10 to 15 years. Many larger universities started um, again in the late 2000s. But now it's starting to spread to medium and small size universities. For example, my university, Oakland University, has about 20,000 students. And um, we are a doctoral university, but we're still kind of on that medium size scale, I would guess. Um, so there's a few reasons why academic libraries are ideally suited to provide these services to their campuses. Um, first of all, libraries are the place that people go when they need help locating something. They, need, they know they need something. And they need help finding it. So librarians are, are experts at locating different things. So many uh, libraries have been receiving increasing questions about locating data sets. Many faculty have realized that uh, data sets are an important output of a researcher's scholarship. So they're either using another researcher's data set uh, for their own unique research purposes, 
or a lot of them are having their students look at data sets and do their own analysis and draw conclusions from that as a way of getting them to analyze that primary data. Also, libraries can help um, our patrons meet the requirements of these funding agencies. So this go ba goes back to the DMP requirement that I mentioned previously. So if, you, if the uh, grant applicant does receive the grant money from the funding agency, they are expected to put the research data management practices from the data management plan into practice. And, and they need help doing that. They haven't been asked to do that before. It's not part of their training as an undergraduate or as a graduate student. So many are unsure and unaware how to do that. And of course, libraries are excellent at preservation and sharing. That's been our core function for many hundreds of years. We know how to keep things safe and we know how to share them widely. But we're just talking about doing it in a little bit of a different context. And finally, many librarians are unique in that they have this university-wide network that they can tap into in order to solve problems. We may not be the IT experts on campus, but we know where to point people. We have contacts in the research office and the administration, different um, disciplinary departments. So we can tap into that network in order to help um, patrons who come to us um, put these RDM practices into place. So that's it for my overview. And now I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about how I started from scratch at Oakland or OU about two years ago in creating what I call research data support at my library. So I was hired at OU as the research data librarian. And as many of you uh, are probably from medium and small size institutions know that librarians wear multiple hats. Um, I'm also a uh, science librarian, so I'm the liaison to three of the science departments. So um, that means the amount of care and attention I can give to research data management does ebb and flow uh, based on the semester, especially around instructional requests. Um, so for creating research data support, that's what I'm calling um, this area within our library. Obviously, I had to select that name. Um, I needed something that fit well with the terminology that was already being used within my library as well as within the campus. Um, initially, I wanted to call this area Data Support Services, or DSS for short. When I asked my colleagues for advice on that, they said that probably was not a good idea because there was already the Office of Disability Support Services on campus, DSS for short, and it would be confusing to have two different areas use the same acronym on our campus. So with that being said, I changed it to research data support. So to avoid confusion with that other office on our campus. Um, and I also realized that while many universities, larger universities may have the staff and the infrastructure to do a lot of um, more hands-on work with patrons, since I'm only one person and I have my liaison duties in addition to my research data role, I knew that Provide, saying we're providing services might not be the most accurate um, description because I'm, as you can see here in my overarching goal, I'm more about assisting patrons to, to put these RDM practices into place. I can advise them, I can consult with them, but I just being one person, I'm not going to be able to be as hands-on as many other libraries are in creating these services. So I stuck with the name Research Data Support. As I mentioned, the overall goal is assisting patrons in doing a variety of these RDM uh, practices. I cover all of the disciplines, so anybody from the English department and cinema studies all the way up through our, 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 our I Research Institute can come to me. Um, these services are free and open to the whole OU community, so students, faculty, and staff. And I've actually had some really interesting and very productive uh, consultations with staff members here at our university wanting to know how can I organize my files more effectively, how can I store them better. Um, and in working with um, researchers, I realized it was very important to emphasize the free part to those researchers. I just assumed that they would understand that since it's coming from our university libraries, it would be free to everyone. But there was a misconception that my consultations or providing advice might have some sort of cost. So that might be something to think about if you're starting to um, provide any sort of support in this area for your community. And finally, I created um, a, a group 
an advisory group of my colleagues who volunteered to kind of help steer me as I was starting this whole new uh, area of support. I was new to the university, um, so I, I wanted to tap into their institutional knowledge um, to make sure that I was providing things that were needed on our campus and that would make sense to our communities, like the example of not using the acronym DSS to, in order to not confuse our patrons. So for research data support, I've had two goals over uh, the past two years. The first is capacity building within the library for myself and my colleagues. And then finally providing some targeted outreach in order to spread the word and start getting patrons to use um, this area. So under capacity building within the library, the first thing I started was by offering a workshop series on a variety of data topics. Um, to date, I've held 14 different workshops over the past two years. But these topics ranged every, everywhere from an introduction to research data, management and data, to how do I sh uh, store my data safely and effectively, to um, what types of data and research data management needs are there within the humanities. I made these workshops open to all library faculty and staff here at o OU, and there was varying attendance based on people's um, interests within those topics. For that workshop series, I had two main goals. For myself, I wanted to create a knowledge bank of workshop materials that I could tap into at a later date. So I now have slides, active learning exercises, and discussion questions on a variety of data topics so that when I am asked to present at a lab group meeting or a faculty departmental meeting, I have things already prepped and I can kind of pick and choose from different presentations or tailor it a little bit to whomever the specific audience is. But I'm not making all of these materials from scratch, which has been incredibly helpful. The second goal for my colleagues was to, first of all, increase their comfort and knowledge with data and research data management. Um, my colleagues knew that these areas were of um, emerging trends within academic libraries, but none of them really had any experience with, within those areas. So I wanted to make them more comfortable with those areas and the terminology. Um, and also I wanted them to understand that they can refer really data-related requests to me and to understand what sort of capacity I can serve our patrons. Um, and also just to remind them that it's the old library adage, our patrons don't know what they don't know. So they may get a request that is, is actually a data request, but the patron doesn't articulate it that way. But they can feel free to refer that to me. So for these 14 workshops, if anyone is interested in seeing the topics that I presented, the activities that I created, or the discussion questions, please send me an email and I'm more than happy to share any or all of my workshop materials for you, or with you, pardon me. Um, so this is an example of one presentation I gave um, late in 2016 on how do I document and organize my data so that I can use it now as well as at a later date. These are just a few selected slides to kind of give you an idea of how I structured these workshops. Um, so I always try to infuse real world examples in, into it. So the example of the article being retracted in the lower right slide is an example. Then we moved into talking about why do I want to create this documentation? How do I do it? What tools are there? What are the advantages and disadvantages for these different ways of creating documentation? Then we moved on to organizing your files. Does anybody have digital files that look like the ones up on the left? Unfortunately, I think everybody does, myself included. Then talking about file naming conventions. How can they be used to organize a file? What are some tips or best practices for creating those? Um, and then finally ending with some conclusions or hopefully words of wisdom. Um, and I tried to make these workshops all be incredibly practical so that my attendees can take what they've seen in this workshop, what they've done in that activity, and then apply it um, to their actual practices. And my colleagues were wonderful guinea pigs as an audience for these, so I'm very thankful to them that they sat through these presentations and gave me a lot of feedback, which I was able to then use to improve how I deliver this content uh, for researchers on my campus. 
Another thing I did under capacity building was to create these general RDM web pages. There's a, a bit.ly in the upper right um, that will, sh if you want to take a look at these web pages. So these web pages are meant to be discipline agnostic and a general introduction to research data support and a few topics um, within RDM, which you can see over there on the right. They're not meant to be exhaustive in any way. It's a very high level overview so that people can get a general idea of what research data support can do and how it can be implemented into their research workflows. And on to my second uh, goal of targeted outreach. As we all know as librarians, you, you, if you build it, they necessarily won't come. You have to market and advertise and do outreach in order to make your community aware of what you are, are providing. So I started pretty old fashioned and I just created a paper flyer. I worked with our marketing intern so that the flyer, uh, which you can see here on the left, has the university branding as well as approved um, colors so that it kind of correlated to things that were already being disseminated uh, through the library. So essentially it looks like something official from the library. Um, I recruited my colleagues to distribute it electronically to their faculty and graduate students. I've distributed it many times to my departments as well. And I found one very effective means is actually carrying paper copies with me. Whenever I'm out and about on campus, I have my um, pad folio with me with paper copies of this flyer so that if I strike up a conversation with a faculty member or a graduate student on a whim, I'm able to have them give them something concrete uh, when we're talking about research data management so that they have my contact information, they have a summary of what we can do, they have the bit.ly link that goes to our website. Um, so I found that to be very effective in uh, when I meet people face to face and I also think I've had pretty good success of people contacting me later because the flyer has my contact information. Also with our outreach, it seemed natural to start with my three departments, biological sciences, chemistry, and physics. Um, I've been doing a lot of outreach to those uh, departments, especially the newer faculty, the untenured faculty, because um, they're the ones who are still trying to develop their research agenda, uh, recruit graduate and undergraduate students, apply for grants to fund their labs, that sort of thing, they've been very receptive um, to me coming in and doing consultations or advising them on how to improve their practices in certain places. And of course, word of mouth is always a great uh, marketing tool, which I can't control, of course. Um, I did a uh, consultation for a biological sciences professor and his uh, lab group. Once we were done with that consultation, I was just chatting with the professor and he said, Oh, 15 minutes before we met, I bumped into my colleague and I told him that you were coming to talk to us today about these research practices and this other professor, he just started sweating. He said, oh my goodness, we need this in our lab too and he'll be reaching out to you soon. And sure enough, in a few days time, I got um, an email from this other professor and I did a similar workshop for his lab group as well. Um, so this summer, my new area of outreach is to target some of our summer research internships. We have very active um, programs within several departments, as well as our iResearch Institute um, to give students these research opportunities. And I'm hoping that within their seminar series that students are asked to attend, um, we can assert a little bit of the library as well as research data management, hopefully to give these undergraduate students a taste of research data management as they're developing their research skills. So that's an overview of what I have done so far within my library. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have at the end, but you're probably thinking, so how do I translate this to my library or how can I get started? Um, so here's a few tips I have about how you can start with data or research data management within your library. The first thing is, of course, just to increase your personal knowledge in this area. I know a lot of um, other uh, people who are interested in data have started discussion groups or working groups with colleagues who are also interested in this area because it helps them to have a forum where they can discuss things, but it also gives them a sense of accountability as well. They don't want to let their colleagues down um, in these groups. 
Also, just remember that you can start with the basics. You don't have to go super, super advanced, right, to begin with. You're not going to be talking about, let's learn how to fork code on Git and let's and the version control that's, our, that's in Git. You know, start with the basics. Try and think of what you already know or what you already do and how data can kind of fork off of that. For example, we often help patrons with citing scholarly publications. Let's talk about how we can cite data sets as a scholarly output. There are um, styles within um, APA, Chicago, MLA, et cetera, on how they uh, would cite a data set. We can also talk about, in terms of data visualization, how do I choose a chart type in Excel? When do I use a pie chart versus a column chart versus a scatter plot? Those could be very useful things and things that many people have experience with um, and may not think of it as uh, data visualization. Also, put your ear to, your, to the ground at your campus. If you haven't started hearing about data opportunities on your campus already, once you kind of have this new focus or frame of reference, I, I bet you'll start to hear a lot more about the data needs or the difficulties with research data management at your campus. Remember, they may not be using the term data. They might be using something else. I knew one humanities professor who said, I don't have data, but I have all of this stuff. He calls his data stuff, actually. So the word data was foreign to him. Also, see if people have already received data requests within your library, maybe the staff that works at your reference desk or the other liaisons. Have they been getting requests to um, have storage space for data or um, requests for locating data sets, that sort of thing? Also, start learning about your university's data-related policies. This can be very important to know what your university has in place already um, in terms of information security, copyright, IP, data retention, data ownership, data transfer. All of these policies are really important to know um, before you can start consulting with someone um, on putting research data management practices into place. So with that, I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Elaine Meyer, who's going to be talking about her experiences at her academic library. So we are going to do a quick uh, a switch in sharing screens. Thank you, Joanna. Oh, no. Oops. Let's see. Okay, Elaine, are you able to see the share screen? Yes. Button? Okay. Share screen. Oh, I did. I did. Can you hear? Can you see my slides? Okay. I did. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. Hmm. Um. Let me um. Like it's telling me that it's it's presenting, but I guess it's not presenting. It may just be showing um. You could, I think you can present, but then you also want to share this, like your desktop. Oh, okay. Or just your app. I apologize, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. There's the speaker. Okay, and then oh, share screen. Okay. Um, There we go. Oh, good. Okay, good. Okay. And then, oh, my cheat sheet. <laughs> oh, why is this not? There we go. All right. Um, oh, welcome, everyone. Um, let's see. Oh, my apologies. I'm just, just kind of getting everything organized. Um, things aren't matching up with my the notes and let's see. Okay. All right. So your research data are important. Uh, research research data service is a network of services throughout the library to assist you during all phases of the research cycle. 
Um, so today we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about two of the six research data services that M, M, M Library offers. Um, so, as you all know, the University of Michigan is a very big institution. They have quite a few resources and can, you know, and, and so they're they're a good model for some of these services, just because they have more people and resources to um, to provide them. So we're going to start looking at data management planning. There's a data management planning services that's offered through um, from the engineering librarians at U of M. Then we're also going to take a look at um, Deep Blue Data, which is part of the data sharing and publication area here. So let's see. All right, so um, we talk about the, D D the DMP review service. All right, so the DMP re review service goal is to support the development of strong, effective data management plans, otherwise known as DMPs, by the College of Engineering, which is Ann Arbor, and the College of Engineering and Computer Science, which is Dearborn. And so, so Ann Arbor is really running the show, and Dearborn, we're lucky to be able to work with them to provide or to take advantage of what they've already done and use it here. So I'm very thankful for that. And I also should say, like in the bottom corner here, there's um, Jim Ottaviani from Ann Arbor. He is um, he is in charge of Deep Blue, but he's also a comic book writer on the side. And so he made these wonderful comics about Deep Blue data, which we'll talk about in a bit. So it's just a little preview. But you know, who would want to put their data on a cassette tape? You know. <laughs> Oops. Let's see. So from those DMPs, there's, you know, Joanna mentioned a couple of these agencies, NSF and the DOE that we work with. So for the U of M Data Management Planning Review Service, um, they have a website specifically set for that. And then um, this is their email address to submit a DMP for the researchers to use. Um, I think from a time standpoint, I'm not going to show you this page because we're going to just talk about everything on this page but if you want to look at it later you can the the service website so when you submit your dmp to the review service um, there's some things that you need to tell the librarians so they know so they have the context of your project um, so you need to sell them the short description of the project or the method the agency and directorate in or division because different um Agencies have some different um, things that they look for or need. And the official title, proposal approval, and the sponsor deadline of the grant. And so who is going to be reviewing the DMP? It's um, primarily the librarians. If there's some technical, like if someone has a very big data set and needs a lot of storage, or there's some technical things to figure out, then the IT staff member will, will help out. So I think there's um, a, well, a dedicated person from IT, and if they need more people, then they have that support. So I, I, I think this is a great way to conduct this service, review service. It's been working well for us at Dearborn. And so when a, when a data management plan is received through that email that we saw, well, the document is uploaded into Google Drive and shared with the specific people who are gonna be reviewing the DMP as well as the person who submits the DMP. So Google Drive, there's Google Docs. And so Google Docs is pretty great because on the next bullet, there's a, a suggestion feature. So as librarians, we can look at the text and make suggestions, but we're not, we're never going to edit their data, or I'm sorry, their, their text for them because we're just giving suggestions. So the researcher can either accept or reject those, you know, take it or leave it. Um, and then the turnaround time, the service is guaranteed 10 business days, but usually we try to get it done um, a lot sooner than that. So um, for promoting the DMP review service, um, we didn't quite have all the, the great comics yet. <laughs> so it isn't exciting, as exciting as Deep Blue Data, but it was more of me going to different 
uh, like my, my College of Engineering CECS faculty meetings um, and talking with people in person. I emailed the CECS faculty list to remind them. I'm, I'm thankful that they actually put me on their faculty list. I don't know how many different librarians get to do that, but it's been very handy to know what they're up to and be able to send them occasionally things to promote services. Um, and then I, I did a lot of just talking to people and asking them, you know, are you submitting any grant applications and, you know, what's upcoming for you? Oh, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much the review service. And if you have any other questions about it, we can talk about it at the end. Next, we're going to talk about Deep Blue Data. So this is the data sharing and publication um, part of the research data services from U of M. So there's another great comic, you know, you don't want to keep your brain in a jar. <laughs> That's not going to help. So Deep Blue Data is an expansion of Deep Blue, which is U of M's institutional repository for uh, learning objects. Like um, the main thing is their, their papers, the papers that go in there, the dissertations, theses. And you can also put like PowerPoints and, and other things in there that are learning objects that aren't data. And so Deep Blue Data accepts um, data from any, all disciplines. Like I'm, I'm focusing on engineering today because that's what I cover. Um, but any discipline, everybody has data. So it can be data in any format and preferably open and non-proprietary and widely used formats are our best. And then data in all sizes that are technically possible. And I think there's a aerospace engineer in Ann Arbor who has like 100 gigs. It was a very, very big data deposit and they were trying to figure out what to do with it. <laughs> but I think they, they made it happen. So this is um, just a rundown of the features and benefits of Deep Blue Data. Deep Blue data. So those um, cards that you saw in the beginning, if you flip over the card, on all of them, it shows you, it, it tells you the features and benefits. So it's a really great way to um, look at a cool comic and then get the scoop on Deep Blue Data on the other side. So it's, it teams up with Deep Blue. So they kind of work in a pair. And actually from one to the other, you can put a DOI on your data that connects to your paper in Deep Blue and the other way around, which is pretty great. Um, so it's a way to publish your data and then it, ensures that your data are preserved for future use. Um, and as I mentioned, you can assign a DOI to your data. You can also cite your data. And then from that, you are complying with the requirements from your funding agency. So you can you know, check that off the list and then gain visibility and promote your scholarship by sharing your data, which is like you know, promoting yourself and your work. So we are gonna take a quick look at this I can make this. Can everybody see the deep blue data? Yep, we can see it. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to make this pretty quick because we don't have a lot of time. But so here in the in the right, you can log in as yourself. So as if up at the top right. So if you wanted to deposit something, you would do that there. Um, as a librarian, they have a, a proxy. Um, so I can deposit things on the behalf of faculty and it still is um, it's still deposited formally under their name um, but here there's featured works you can browse and we'll, we'll look at the deposit briefly um, I was going to show you let's see this is one of our math professors David James he retired last year but he really wanted to get this into the into Deep Blue and Deep Blue Data. So he went to Europe um, every year for 15 years for th three weeks at least in the summertime and he toured all these museums and he was interested in the, the patterns behind these folk costumes. And so here you can see, you know, he has an ex Excel spreadsheet listing the information of each of the 18, over 18,000 costume designs that he, that he, you know, examined and got the data from. So so he had this and he wanted to, he didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> and so I'm like, why don't you put it in deep blue data? 
So this is the, um, all the metadata for him. There's a description, his methodology. He okay, said so there, there 73 European cultures, wow. The depositor is, and then here, this citation to related material. This is important because you can go to um, Deep Blue and it connects you to the associated paper, which I think is really great. Um, I think that's probably about much time, as much time as we have for Deep Blue right now, but um, let's see. So outreach was actually really fun for this, um, you know, because data to some people just, it isn't that exciting. <laughs> you know, we like it generally, but so we tried to make it more interesting and get people to come listen to us talk about it. <laughs> so um, first we had, I did, I had a cake for the library faculty here in the library to, um, so to train them so they could start working with their, um, their groups. So I brought in a similar cake to what you see there and we had cake, you know, with the library. And the next, this is my next endeavor. It was engineering lab day. And, um, you know, we couldn't have any cake in the lab, but we could have it in the hallway. And so a lot of students and faculty came by and, you know, I would give a hand out my um, postcards and talk to them about where, what their projects were, what they're up to lately, if they had any data they wanted to deposit. And I, and it, I thought it was the M library folks, they really wanted to make it this more fun with the postcards and the uh, laptop stickers. And we also had little chocolates, but I think, I think everyone ate all the chocolates because I, they didn't have any anymore. <laughs> so my, my reason for going here had actually two prongs. I was, I was advertising Deep Blue Data and also they haven't had a formal engineering librarian before. So that was another one of my objectives for engineering day, lab day. So this is a close up of the cake. And then these are um, laptop stickers. So that's my laptop. So I just put all four of them on there so I can show them to people because they're, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty cool, I have to say. And then with the laptop stickers and the postcards, I would just take them with me and I had them wherever I went and I would stuff mailboxes for CECS and I also am the liaison for math. I would bring them with me to events and, um, and people would be like, it really sinks in, you know, when you look at like the, the one under the bed, you know, you can't keep your, your data under your bed. That's not going to work very well. <laughs> yeah, the chocolates were really great. They, they were pretty high quality chocolates. And um, so they went pretty fast, but I put them in the faculty mailboxes and pass those out at events as well. All right, so back to Joanna for resources for learning more about RDM. So thank you. Let's see. Thanks, Elaine. So um, now we're gonna talk about some more resources that you can learn more about data, data research, data management, and data librarianship itself. So next slide, please. Um, Next. So one great resource that I've used a lot is other libraries and librarians um, stuff that they've made available online. You can type in research data management libguide and there will be many examples that come up. So you can see the different ways that universities are providing these services, how they are naming the services, what they do and don't put on their websites. Um, the great part about librarianship is that we're very open to sharing and um, collaborating with other people. So many librarians make their um, materials freely available online. For example, the University of Minnesota has um, entire materials from an entire workshop series available online. Um, University of Wisconsin has a, a video series that they made for researchers. But it's a great place for you to kind of look and see what other libraries are doing um, and sometimes emulate what they're doing. They have some, a lot of them put Creative Commons licenses on the images that they've created or the diagrams that they've made. So it's something that you can reuse. So again, this idea of not create, recreating the wheel, like you can re reuse what's already been produced. There's some gritty, pretty great blogs out there by data librarians. Data Ab Initio is by a, a, a one data librarian and Data Librarians is a group of um, data librarians who uh, post occasionally. 
there is a Coursera course that has been going on for a few years. Um, if you're interested in pursuing that, the next one starts uh, relatively soon, I think next week. Um, and that's done by a uh, taught by a well renowned data librarian. If you're a big Twitter fan, um, data librarians are really, really active on Twitter. There's uh, three hashtags there that they often use, um, but there's more hashtags. But um, Twitter can be a great way to learn what people are talking about, to um, start participating in that conversation without having to travel to conferences uh, or, or things like that. So next slide, please. Um, there's also lots of books that have been written on this topic. Um, a few caveats with books on research data management. The first is that many are, are very theoretical in nature rather than practical. Um, these two books here are very practical. So they basically tell you what practices you should be putting into place in order to store your data safely, safely in order to organize your, your files efficiently. That's personally what I like. Um, also, another caveat is um, research data management has been um, very well discussed in the UK, the EU, as well as Australia. So many of the publications on RDM um, come out of those uh, geographic areas. So many of the things they talk about are, are very relevant to what we do in the US, but some things are not relevant. For example, the EU has very different privacy laws than the US does. Um, so so there's, just make sure you know which perspective um, that publication is coming from um, as you're reading it. Personally, my favorite book is the first one, Data Management for Researchers by Kristen Briney. She's a PhD chemist turned data librarian at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. So it's not, it's a medium-sized university. It's not the huge university. That's University of Wisconsin-Madison in her state. She's in Milwaukee. So she really comes at it from a practical perspective using her background as a chemist, um, as well as being at a university that's smaller so she doesn't have as many resources. She's the only person doing data at her academic library. Um, and I found her book very approachable. It's written very in, in an approachable way. It's easy to understand. It is meant for scientists, but I think it's applicable to all disciplines. The second one, the data book, um, by Meredith Sozas is she's a bioinformationist. So her book is a little bit more technical. There's more um, information about data processing and data analyzing. Um, so that one is just a little bit more technical. If you're looking for some professional development opportunities, um, I'd highly suggest the next, either of these two. There's the Research Data Access and Preservation Summit or RDAP Summit that happens every year. Um, unfortunately, this summit happened last month, March, so you'll have to wait until 2019 um, to attend. But if you'd like to see um, what went on at that um, conference, there was a very active uh, Twitter stream going on with that hashtag RDAP18. Um, and they also have made all of the materials, uh, all the presentation materials from that summit are openly available on, on the web also, so you can look at those presentations. Um, as well. Also, um, for a little bit more casual professional development opportunity, there are these data library and symposiums. Um, there's one in the New England area, the Midwest area, and the Southeast area. There may be other ones throughout the U.S. that I'm not aware of. Um, I'm only aware of these three currently. And they basically bring people in the academic libraries where their data librarians are interested in So they bring together these people and they talk more about um, just it's more discussion based a little bit more casual on um, the different data topics so it's less just you sit and listen to formal presentations um, so those happen throughout the u.s you are welcome to attend any of them it doesn't have to be in the geographic location or region where you are located um, they're willing they're perfectly happy to have librarians from all over the US as well as Canada in those different areas. Um, so next slide, please. And then finally, last year, there was this really great article in College and Research Library News um, written by Sarah Barbrow and her colleagues. Um, Sarah is a, a data librarian of compiling and uh, these resources for novice data librarians or any librarian who has an interest in data 
and giving a short little abstract of each of these. So there's additional resources that I haven't highlighted in the slides as well. Um, so those are great places to look at, look at for more places to see materials uh, and learning objects that libraries have developed, listservs, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, after today's webinar, um, we will be sharing the link to the recording of the webinar as well as these slides. So you'll, you'll have opportunity to click all of those links in the slides um, later. So next slide, please. So that is the end of our formal presentation. Elaine and I are happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Okay, thank you very much, Joanna and Elaine. Um, we do have some questions in the chat, so I will just start from the, the first one that we got. Um, so this question is for Elaine. Um, how many data management plans do you review per year, uh, whether that's you personally or just in general for the deep blue service? That's a good question. Um, I'm still promoting the service here. I've, I've actually done three and we, I started the DMP service with Ann Arbor probably a, a little more than a year ago. I didn't, I didn't start it right when I started two years ago. Um, so I guess I kind of keep hoping for more <laughs> people to, it's, it's hard for them. And I think part of it is, is trusting people a little bit you know, to review their DMP because it's such a, a lot of money and, you know, time and it has such implications, you know, if they get their grant or not. So um, I think it's still part of me earning their trust. But anyway, yeah, I've, I've done three. Okay. Um, the next question is also for you regarding Deep Blue. Um, do you allow Google to, to, to scrape Deep Blue? Sorry, is it searchable via Google? Um... I could test that out. I, I would hope so, but I, I don't know for sure. Um, but I could maybe do a quick search for the European folk costumes. Elaine, if I could jump in. I, I previously worked at University of Michigan and Deep Blue and Deep Blue Data are both um, indexed by Google. So I think that's another benefit they try and stress to um, faculty when they deposit is that it's a way of broadly disseminating your research data. Okay, great. Um, the next question is for Joanna. Um, e, I know we are going to be sharing this presentation with all of its links, but um, there was a question. Would you be willing to share the research data services PowerPoint that you use with your faculty and students? Sure, I am welcome. I am uh, open to sharing any of the um, presentations that I have developed. Um, I tend to uh, create a new presentation uh, based on the, my target audience, so I don't reuse a lot of presentations. Um, it really depends on what their interests are. So if it's a, a lab group, I might talk about how do you store data, how do you organize it, and how do you document it. Um, so a, a lab group in the biological sciences might be interested in that. Whereas if I'm talking with education researchers, I might add in some more things about how do you find existing data sets like census data? And then how can you share your data safely because it has um, information related to human subjects in it? Um, my email address is listed there on the slide, so feel free to email me if you have any specific um, interests and topics or you would just like to see kind of a general presentation that I've created. I'm happy um, to share any of that with, with you. Okay, um, our next question, this is a more technical question, um, but this is what platform is Deep Blue Data built on? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. I almost want to say Fedora, but I'm not 100% on that. Um, I can get back to you if you like. And uh, thank you for, for that. Um, and also we have a thank you for in advance for sharing the slides with the links, which and it's, it's got a lot of great resources there. So I, I agree with that. Um, does anybody have any further questions for our speaker? All 
All right. Well, I'm, I'm not hearing any, so um, I will just say thank you again to our speakers, Joanna and Elaine. Um, thank you also to all of our, our attendees who came out and saw us today. I hope this was helpful for you. Um, and again, if you have any follow-up questions, please do feel free to email of our speakers um, and look for the email that will share the recording and the presentation. Thanks very much, everyone.